You, yes, you, listener. Did you know that everybody at History Hack works for free? And as much fun as that is, it would be great if we could garner just a little bit of support for all of the time and effort that goes in to producing the show. Uh, I have a cat that needs food. Zach has Airfix models to buy. And Boney, well, Boney likes books. So if you can chuck us a couple of quid as a one-off by Kofi or subscribe to Patreon, we would much appreciate it. Thank you. Hello and welcome to History Hack. Uh, we have a very shell-shocked looking guest right now because he's just watched the last 10 minutes of another recording with a complete powerhouse of a person and I think he's now absolutely terrified of this. Zach, who, do, who have you invited on today? So today we have Edward Gillen who is going to be talking to us about his new book Entente Imperial, British and French Power in the Age of Empire. Ed is a historian specialising in 19th century science and technology, and he's also the author of The Victorian Palace of Science. Ed, apologies for the sort of crash course in what it's like working in the, you know, madhouse that is History Hack. Welcome. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be here, and it's been wonderfully entertaining, and, and we've only just started. So. <laughs> do you know what's brilliant as well is that poor Ed is about to do an interview on a book that COVID has delayed forever, and he's panicking that he doesn't remember anything in it. So just like, let's let's go gentle, Zach. Uh, I don't know <laughs> please, come on, you're going to be fine. You can do this. It'll all come flooding back. Mm. Let's start with the premise behind this book, because we traditionally think of the relationship between Britain and France to be antagonistic throughout the 19th century. Uh, Zach will definitely think that as a Napoleonic historian. Uh, you don't agree. Um, it's not so much that I don't agree, but it's more that I think that it's far more complex than that. Um, and I think that this is something that's true, not just for the 19th century, but throughout, well, throughout the last thousand years, basically, of history. I mean, it's a very, very easy and common cliche stereotype to, to think about Britain and France being these rivals and constantly at each other's throats, competing in all matters, be it, you know, football or warfare. You know, and uh, when people think of relations, uh, relations between Britain and France, they immediately think of Agincourt, Trafalgar, Waterloo, France surrendering in 1940, but Britain, you know, bravely going on alone. So it's a relationship which has been characterised um, in the popular imagination by a lot of distrust. Um, and that's not to say that there's not an element of truth to that. Um, but it's more that during the 19th century, the relationship between Britain and France was profoundly productive at several moments, several key moments. Yes, there was the Napoleonic Wars uh, at the start of the century, and by the end of the century, Britain and France are almost at war in the middle of Africa. But during the 1850s, there's this period of about 10, 12 years where Britain and France, they managed to unite their interests and together exert a considerable, in fact, actually probably by European standards, an unprecedented amount of influence uh, over global affairs. Um, we have this traditional image of Britain in the 19th century being able to sort of go it alone because Britain had a huge empire and Britain had lots of industry. But actually, without allies on the continent, without, and specifically France, because France for most of the 19th century was Britain's main rival, without allying with France, Britain actually found it quite difficult to exert itself, especially in continental affairs. Um, so I suppose what I'm arguing for is a, is a more complex relationship, um, focusing on the 19th century. But I mean, it, you know, I think to anyone that really looks into history, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, this is something that has characterized, you know, large parts of our history. I mean, back to the Hundred Years' War, you know, where so much of France was English, basically. I mean, you've only got to, you've only got to go cycling through the Dodoine to see, you know, sort of all the relics of Plantagenet power. And, you know, you've only got to go out for dinner in London to see all the influence of French cuisine. So, you know, how could you separate the two? Zach, are you sold so far? <laughs> I mean, I've devoted, what is it, 10 years of my life to studying the, the, the ag, if you will, between Britain and France. So this is, this is, taking, some, this is taking some digesting, but it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, and I'm... Straight away, I'm interested in the kind of the diplomatic side of things, which has become my new sort of day job when I'm not history hacking in terms of how Britain, certainly in the sort of first half, let's say first third plus of the, the 19th century, is kind of struggling to work out what it wants to do in Europe. 
And does it want to be drawn into the whole kind of system of congresses and so on that we see in the wake of Napoleon's defeat? Or does it want to just kind of let the Europeans get on with their thing and then the British can get on with theirs? And, you know, sort of perhaps a little element of um, chaos between the European powers might be a beneficial thing to Britain. What are your thoughts on all of that? Um, I think, yeah, I would probably agree with that. I mean, Britain has always had this, I mean, not just at the start of the 19th century, but generally has always had this um, troubled notion of where it stands in terms of uh, European affairs. Is Britain part of Europe or does it see its interests uh, beyond Europe? Um, I think that what I'm saying is that during the 1850s, um, particularly under, I mean, I think that British foreign policy has a much firmer direction and is much more committed to European affairs. And I think that's principally down to the influence of a uh, of foreign secretary and from 1855, the prime minister Palmerston, who I think causes something of a diplomatic revolution. I mean, certainly, you know, the, the elements of Anglo-French um, alliance are there during the 1830s and 1840s, but they really crystallize in the 1850s, um, largely because I think that Britain's always rather anxious over France because France always has the potential to invade Britain. We're always scared that historically the French are suddenly going to invade. And while British politicians often like to try and you know ignore all that and sort of not get off, um, the fact that France keeps descending into revolution means that Britain's most powerful neighbour is constantly being destabilised and is constantly, you know, potentially drifting back to the sort of revolutionary state that France was during the 1790s and 1800s, where Britain was at war with France for, you know, sort of almost 25 consecutive years. Um, in 1848, there is the French Revolution and uh, there is the coup, Napoleon, Louis Napoleon, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew comes to power. Um, he makes himself emperor. And initially there's a lot of fear that this is, this is Napoleon Bonaparte all over again. But it soon becomes apparent that Napoleon, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, is actually someone that Britain can do business with. He's quite a reliable statesman. He's, he's got clear direction in foreign policy. And importantly, that foreign policy does not involve invading Britain. So here's someone that Palmerston recognises he can do business with. And I think really it's, uh, it's sort of this determination to work with a stable European neighbour, which does draw Britain more and more into, um, into European affairs. Um, notably, as I hope we'll talk about later on, the Crimean War in 1854, which is very much, um, you know, it's in large part down to Napoleon III's international aspirations. So in terms of that, I mean, we're, we're sort of jumping ahead slightly in the story here, but we will sort of come back to the Crimean War um, and, and, you know, before that as well. But um, in terms of that, that shift, if you will, how difficult is it to carry the country with um, the, this sort of different direction in British foreign policy? Because you've got a lot of, particularly during the Napoleonic era, there's a, a big emphasis, and Linda Colley writes about this, how the, the early stages of forming British national identity basically come, becomes a case of characterizing being British as being not French. Mm -hmm. um, and so where, where you've got that trickling down and where Britain invests a huge amount in this idea that four nations came together to defeat France and Spain and Portugal and Waterloo and so on, that obviously has a, an impact because it's there, it's rammed in people's faces through heroes propaganda. They build around the kind of the memory of Waterloo and, and the preceding victories. So how does the public react to that shift in emphasis? Well, I mean, I think that is... I think that probably the first question you asked was about why do we have this idea that the relationship between Britain and France is so antagonistic? Well, I think it's because undoubtedly the public never really gets sold on the whole pro-French idea in Britain. Um, I mean, the fact is that during the 1850s, politicians like Palmerston and actually the Conservative Foreign Secretary as well, um, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, most of the leading sort of statesmen of this time, um, from a very pragmatic, practical view, are happy to work with the French, but when it comes to popular domestic politics, are almost always criticizing the French and sort of, you know, bigging them up as the great rivals. I think that it's no coincidence that between 1848 and 1860, relations between Britain and France are actually very stable um, at a very practical diplomatic level. 
we're not really that close to war. And yet there's at least two huge war scares, completely irrational panics that France might suddenly invade, which threatens to undermine all this. And it's interesting that individuals like Palmerston, while negotiating with the French um, to exert, uh, you know, to go into Russia in a war, to go into China in a war, to, to trade more, um, in public, the public rhetoric, they're always bigging France up as this great rival that we have to be frightened of and stoking public alarm. Um, so there is this sort of this, this very careful balance, I think. Um, I mean, in a way, I think what made Palmerston such an effective politician, I'm not a huge fan of Palmerston, although it's gonna sound like some kind of tribute to him, but actually one of the things that made Palmerston so successful, I mean, he basically ran Britain's foreign policy for 20 odd years. Um, was that domestically he was very good at appearing very British, very anti-French, but then when it came to the practical business of international diplomacy, of empire building, whatever you want to call Victorian foreign policy back then, um, he's just very pragmatic and prepared to, you know, to work with the French. Um, so it's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the British public don't ever really get sold on the idea. And actually it's true of the French public as well. The French public, um, they're not big fans of the British generally. Um, I mean, uh, there was, when they were trying to get financing for the Suez Canal in the late 1850s, um, there was one very famous story where the canal's promoter, Ferdinand de Lesseps, you know, he recalls this story of this old soldier who'd fought at Waterloo, turning up to buy shares in the canal company. He didn't know what the company was gonna do or where the canal was. He thought it was some, I don't know, project railway in Sweden or something like that, apparently he's very confused. But the soldier said, I'll put anything into a project that is anti-British or anti-English. Um, so, you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of sentiment on both sides of the channel, popular hostility, I suppose. Okay, I'm gonna cut you some slack now before Zach. I mean, Zach's like a terrier on this because he's got so many questions. You open the book by looking at the great exhibition um, and, that's a really logical place, I guess, because that is all about Britain's place in the world and showing it off and everything. So how important is it um, in bringing France and Britain together and acknowledging each other's scientific achievements? Yeah, um, well, I mean, that's the thing. The Great Exhibition, 1851, is supposed to be this sort of, you know, this high point of Victorian hubris and self-confidence. I mean, you know, the empire is sort of, you know, rapidly expanding industry is completely unrivaled British science British machinery steam power iron production it, it's all completely unrivaled um, and the Victorians are so self-confident and actually if you look at the next sort of 10-20 years there's a number of checks to that confidence you know Crimea is a bit of a shambles um, you know Britain's left di diplomatically isolated later in the 1860s you know, and Germany and the United States start competing economically with Britain throughout the second half of the century. So this is the apex of British hubris. And yet, when the actual Crystal Palace is underway, the lesson that most domestic audiences take and commentators in the newspapers is, you know, how wonderful French industry and French, the, the French economy is. Yes, Britain might have the heavy industry of the machines of, of steam powered technology, um, but, what comes from the Great Exhibition is that France is really leading the way in the production of high quality luxury goods, um, clothing, shoes, uh, furnishings, um, and especially um, articles de Paris, which are like these sort of uh, small delicate goods, uh, things like highly decorative boxes and fans, you know, high sort of very tasteful luxury goods. Um, the French commentators that turn up at the Great Exhibition are actually slightly underwhelmed by Britain's <laughs> performance. Just, um, they're just very self-satisfied um, with how well uh, their country's done. Um, and, and as I say, that the, the British commentators, I mean, sometimes, you know, there is some self-satisfaction definitely with what Britain's achieved. There's a lot of um, confidence and pride in the actual building itself, the glass, the iron construction of the Crystal Palace. Um, but most British commentators, when they look at what France is doing, they say, you know, France, very, very high quality goods. They've got this incredibly rich bourgeoisie culture, particularly Parisian culture. And they actually, rather than, rather than looking to the machines and the steam power that has made 
Britain's economy so successful. They actually looked to the women of Paris as the cause of France's economic success. They sort of say that, you know, the reason that France is so tasteful is that domestic budgets are controlled by women. French women have a lot of taste. They're taught to manage the house very, very well, domestic affairs, and make it very stylish. And, you know, there's this sort of sense of jealousy, I think, amongst British commentators that um, it's sort of like Britain's specifically British women, um, lack the taste of their Parisian counterparts. Um, and during the 1850s, the response is, you know, there are several societies that British promoters of arts and, and crafts kind of uh, are, are eager to, to cultivate, the, um, the Society of Arts, which 18th century, but they initiate a huge program of reforms to British industry, to British crafts. You know, a, a great period of self-reflection follows the Great Exhibition, largely because of the French performance. That's really curious that there is this sense that French women are sort of better at kind of occupying their domestic sphere and that effectively British women are just just aren't as good as, you know, going and looking after the household and going into the kitchen <laughs> as the patriarchy dictates. It is all the British people seeing that as a win, like all the British <laughs> girls anyway, just like, yeah, uh, I'll take that one, thanks. Yeah, you're, you're better domesticated than I am, French lady, you knock yourself out. Well, I think it's, I think it's more that British women aren't trusted with the household budgets. <laughs> that the French women are trusted with the, but they're given spending power. So British women, they might well be as tasteful as the French. Who knows? But they aren't. They never get the chance to prove it by spending it. You know? What's brilliant? I said so there's an epic example of this is Sir Douglas Haig, who does all of the. Uh, he's quite. He's a traditional guy. Uh, proposes to his very. I mean, he was very attractive as well. You've all heard me wax lyrical about uh, young Haig. His wife was a stunner. He proposed to her after three days. They got married. It's all very traditional. When he goes off to the First World War, um, they're massively in debt. Like they've got all these loans to pay back and everything. And she has to take over because he's not there. And he is utterly amazed and pleased and proud of how his wife just takes over all the finances, gets the overdraft down faster than he ever has. But he's just like, this is wonderful. Who'd have thought my wife could manage this in my absence? There's a curious contrast there with Wellington and Kitty Pakenham, because one of the points at which he went absolutely ballistic with Kitty, and that's a whole very unhappy marriage, is a point at which... Um, somebody basically turned around and said the Duke of Wellington cannot pay his milk bill uh, because Kitty was so uh, was struggling so much in terms of mismanaging her budget that she, she was basically in debt and Wellington turned around and said look I got no issue if you need me to give you more money for you running the household but you are not gonna see a situation happen where I am not paying my milk bill I am not having people so that I can't pay for my own milk. <laughs> Oh. Well, Wellington, he did. Wellington had a, had good taste. I think he had. Uh, I mean, he did. Um, he picked the most tasteful building in Paris for the British Embassy. I think he was yeah. given a choice between I forget what it's called, but the building that's currently the British Embassy, or um, the alternative was the Elysee, the palace. And he thought the Elysee was really rather vulgar. So his art the... collection is something else as well. Oh yeah, Apsley House. Yes. And before yeah. anybody says no, it's not bloody stolen. <laughs> oh, and also as well, so don't mention Apsley House because then Marcus will want to come in and give us a lecture on all of the pieces of art that are in there because he used to work there. Right, okay. I know one thing, we, we did a thing on the charge of the heavy brigade the other day, which may or may not go out before this episode because that's just how we roll. But um, we were laughing at how some of the British officers couldn't, they, they kept referring to the enemy as the French because it, they just couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that we were on the, on the same side in this life. But I don't understand, it's the French. Uh, the Crimean War features in your book. So we often talk about the confusion of them working with the French and how they just can't can't wrap their heads around it, can they? Because this is the old enemy. Uh, how much impact does the way, um, how much impact does the war have in changing that perception? Before I, before I answer that, yeah, I, I do. Lo I love that that thing about sort of like British officers constantly referring to the, the Russians. Kill the French. French. No, and no, no, not this time. I, I love that. Was it the, the 1967 um, Charge of the Light Brigade where John Gielgud plays Lord Raglin, like this poor withered old one-armed Lord Raglin. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and there are these French messengers that arrive. And he's just sort of storming around the house like, oh, we're surrounded, surrounded. It's the French. But they've only really come to bring him some news. But um. How much does the war change uh, the idea of France as the enemy? Well, 
Um, not a lot, I, I actually think. Um, bizarrely, I, I think that during the actual war, um, between 1854 and 1856, um, it, um, it, it does temporarily change the idea of the French being the enemy. Um, the correspondence for the Times, um, Russell in particular, you know, they, they actually do wax quite lyrical about how competent the French army is, how brave the French soldiers are, what they endure um, during the miseries of, of, of the Crimea. Um, Florence Nightingale really venerates sort of, you know, she looks to the French uh, organization of medical provisions and hospitals as, as something that Britain needs to, needs to do. And every time there's a failing within British military culture, be it hospitals or, or be it the officer corps, it's always the French that are looked to as, you know, they're so competent, we need to be more like them. So I think there is quite a lot of veneration for the French. Um, and there is also quite a lot of good feeling that's built up, I think, during 1855, Queen Victoria goes on a state visit to see Napoleon in Paris, um, and then Napoleon returns, he visits, um, he visits the Queen, um, she dances with him, really, I think Queen Victoria must have been such a vulgar woman, she made him dance <laughs> with her in the Waterloo ballroom you know, sort of at, at, at the palace, um, sorry, at the Windsor Castle. And, you know, I just think, you know, the poor bloke, really. Um, <laughs> I but, mean, um, I don't think you said no to her. Temper's legendary. I, just, I can't <laughs> yeah, wait to yeah. do this 6,000 word biography of her for this new book, Hodder I've Got Coming Up, because I'm just, I'm going to have a field day. But yeah, do you know that she, her temper was so bad that when uh, she was, so they told Prince Albert to stop going near her after baby number eight, because uh, she used to get herself so worked up and her temper was so bad. I mean, if I'd been pregnant eight times, I think I would have been a screaming mess as well. But it got to the point that when she was pregnant with Princess Beatrice, uh, he wasn't allowed near her and they had to communicate but because he just upset her too much and she got too wound up by his presence they used to have to communicate by sending notes backwards and forwards across the palace oh my god so yeah don't say no to queen victoria if she asks you to dance you've got to yeah. do it I no the trouble is though by not going near her isn't albert effectively saying no to her in a completely different way so that just creates a different kind of tension and frustration within the relationship well I, she liked sex so yeah i think telling her she couldn't have it again a whole new problem it was he was just hiding yeah <laughs> yeah no one told him he didn't have to go no wonder him. he didn't live very i mean it's 1861 you know the poor bloke was worn out yeah. <laughs> yeah. of a life oh, you say that typhoid came as a blessed release <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing became him of his life like the leaving of it <laughs> No, but um, we've thrown you off your game, haven't we, Zach? Come up with a question. I can't. I, we need to move on from Victoria and Albert's sex life. Um, <laughs> we do, we do. Um, but we were talking about, you know, that that relationship and that that diplomatic um, kind of. I almost want to call it. Oh, what's the Cold War term that they use for the throwing of the tension? Is it a détente? Um, I'm probably just making an idiot um, yeah, of myself no, here, but but. You know, that, that sort of improvement of relations that, that you were talking about happens sort of in the 1950s, courtesy of Victoria. Hmm. Well, you see, there is a detente, there is an entente, um, but it's very short lived. The Peace of Paris is signed in 1856, and as soon as Britain and France have signed the peace, they start drifting apart. Well, they don't start drifting apart, they, they remain quite friendly for two years. But then in 1858, um, there are, there's, a, there's a war scare, and all of that goodwill during the Crimea seems to evaporate within the space of a few days. So basically, I mean, I suppose the problem is that Britain and France actually get too close, and the popular sort of popular audiences don't like it. So yeah, 1858, you have the, um, the Orsini, the Orsini affair, where um, there's this uh, Italian radical who, who tries to blow up Napoleon III. There's a bomb attempt. It turns out that he drew up the plans and probably made the bomb in England before trying to kill Napoleon. It fails and Palmerston responds by introducing legislation through parliament, which, um, which would effectively give the French police the power to arrest and extradite terrorists, suspected terrorists from British soil. Um, I mean, God, can you imagine what UKIP would do with that in the 20th or 21st century? I mean, the idea that the French police were given you know, jurisdiction within Britain effectively I don't know whether the police would have actually been allowed to have turned up and arrest people, but they would have been able to instruct the British police to do it at the very least. And this is so controversial, giving away British sovereignty in the 1850s. 
you know, these such cliche arguments that we're still dealing with now, bizarrely. Um, and actually, it, it, it leads to the fall of Palmerston's government. He's been prime minister for three years, trying to introduce this legislation around the Orsini affair, leads to the collapse of the Liberal government, the Conservatives come in. Um, and this idea that Fra France is trying to encroach on British sovereignty, it, it, you know, people just get hysterical over it. Um, you know, within a, and then there's, then there's the news that, you know, Napoleon's um, expanding the naval base at uh, Cherbourg. And then there's the news that the, the French Navy at Toulon has recently launched um, its uh, uh, Le, Le Gloire, um, which is uh, it's a, it's a wooden ship, but it's got iron plates. And it's unlike anything the Royal Navy has. France takes this very temporary lead in naval technology. And altogether, this naval expansion, your senior affair, people just go absolutely mad. I mean, you know, who knew that the British public could be so irrational? And they become completely convinced that there's gonna be an invasion. The Conservative government initially does quite well out of this because it seems very anti-French. Um, but then Benjamin Disraeli, who was probably one of the worst chancellors of the exchequer this country's ever had, and that's saying something, fails to get the budget speech through. He's trying to increase defense spending, but just can't balance the books because he's an idiot at maths. Um, basically, the, that brings down the Conservative government after fewer than 12 months. The Liberals are back in power. And Palmerston comes in and realizes that if he's going to stay in power, he has to big up the Navy. We've got to start launching iron warships like uh, HMS Warrior, which is at Portsmouth. Um, we've got to start bigging up the Navy. We've got to start um, you know, building up defenses along the South Coast. Um, and really, they start ramping up throughout 1859. They start ramping up this sort of anti-French rhetoric um, combined with you know, all this sort of increased defense spending. So all the goodwill of the Crimean War seems to have been lost between 1858 and 1859. And how can they stay friends as well? Because now we're getting into the realms of like the scramble for Africa, we're heading towards and things like that. And we just, we butt up against France the whole time, aren't we? So talk about the Suez Canal, um, because how do we do this without falling out with France? Well, um, yeah, I mean, so the Suez Canal, I mean, it's a French project, really. Britain doesn't really want the Suez Canal. Um, I think p and uh, the steamship company, I mean, it, it, it all, um, provides, you know, a perfectly adequate route to India um, with overland communication through Suez. Um, you know, you, you get your boat to Alexandria or Port Said and then, you know, nip, nip over the isthmus and, and carry on your journey to India. And Britain's quite happy with this system. Um, and it doesn't really want a canal because that would potentially threaten um, sort of you know, geopolitics, Britain's dominance of maritime affairs. But yes, Obviously, the French are obsessed with the canal. I mean, they sort of have been since Napoleon's failed 1798 Egyptian venture, where you know the, the French men of science, you know, see this fantastic, you know, opportunity to build a canal. And it Sorry, gets and Zach's going to want to round that off with, and then Napoleon left his army to die, <laughs> <laughs> like a sissy. Yeah, <laughs> man of destiny. He can't ever, ever. Don't start on the to, whole. Thing he can't let a reference to Napoleon and Egypt go by without reminding everybody that he left them all there in the desert. He ran away when it wasn't going his way. <laughs> At least he never abandoned another army after that. Apart from in <laughs> Russia, that's what <laughs> Zach's <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, that's what Zach's girlfriend's argument would be because uh, she's obsessed with Napoleon. I would just love to be a fly on that wall. But yeah, wow. uh, now that he's interjected with that, oh, um, that's the Suez. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> basically, so there's this well, another Napoleonic kind of figure, um, certainly in terms of self confidence and hubris, is uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps. And he takes up this idea of a canal. Um, he becomes obsessed with it during the 1840s. Um, and he thinks, you know, it's going to revitalize the French economy. Um, and he's not an engineer, though. He's completely bizarre. He's a, a journalist, diplomat, um, cow farmer. Um, but basically, he's a really good salesman. And he manages to get the Egyptian Khedive, uh, king of Egypt and Sudan, to give him permission um, to, to build a canal. Uh, I think 1854, 1855, gets the permission for the canal. And then he returns back to France, but he realizes that, you know, it's gonna be difficult to raise enough capital to finance this venture. So where do you go if you want money 
for a venture in uh, in the 19th century. You go to Britain, you go to London, the centre of world finance. Um, and it's a very compelling case that he makes to British investors. You know, he says, you've got the big empire, you've got most of the world shipping, you'll benefit most from a canal. So you should put money into it. And he comes up with fantastic statistics, you know, to show that, you know, 80% of the traffic, 70 or 80% of all the traffic is going to be British. Britain has the most to gain from this. And he goes on a publicity tour around, um, around the British Isles, uh, around all the trade centers, Liverpool, Manchester, London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, goes around all these trade centers, building up support for the Suez Canal. And there is a lot of support not from Palmerston, who's suspicious of the, the, the French scheme, actually, he, he does worry that this is going to re, you know, this is going to change global affairs. Um, and ultimately, Lesseps doesn't get enough support in Britain and does have to return to France. And it is French investors who provide the majority of the cash. I think it's about 100, and, I think he manages to raise about 110 million francs um, on the French market to, to finance the venture. Um, but he very much saw it as, a, as an international project. It should have been an international project, but it, it, just, it just wasn't because of, of, of fears. But I suppose the moral of the story is that even though Britain doesn't invest in it at the start, by the end, Britain does end up owning it. Um, Britain purchases, I mean, Britain's a big creditor to the Egyptian king, the Egyptian Khedive. Um, when he's bankrupt, the British take most of his shares. Um, and it gives them a majority stake in the canal. Uh, and, and of course, later on, when Britain comes to annex Egypt, um, effectively annex it, uh, it takes control of the, the Suez Canal. And that, that really is the thing that upsets the French later in the century. And that really ends this period of Anglo-French um, uh, cooperation. But we are getting a bit ahead of the story here because things do get quite good between Britain and France again around about 1859, 1860. Well, let's let's talk about one of those high points because you you discuss in the book a free trade treaty. So, how does that come into being, and how wide-reaching and significant is that, particularly for the time? I mean, today we kind of go, yeah, free trade agreements. That's that's something that we're quite accustomed to. Um, certainly, it's been in the news a lot post uh, UK leaving the EU. But for the time, is, is this a new concept? Is this a rarity? I mean, I think that contemporaries would probably say that this was the first um, effective uh, free trade agreement. Um, whether it is or not is a, is a subject to debate. Um, we could talk about that. But um, basically, the free trade treaty has nothing to do with trade. Um, during the 19th century, in British politics, if you want to win a general election, you, you simply, you know, make yourself out to be more free trade friendly than your rivals and you generally win the election and after 1815 British politics is characterized by just continual a continual war relentless attack on tariffs and obviously this culminates in 1846 with the repeal of the corn laws um, and Britain is Britain is probably a free trade nation by by the 1850s France on the other hand is very very protective um, protectionist I suppose and the real reason for that is that the French are absolutely terrified of British iron and coal because Britain's so industrialized, the coal, the iron is so cheap that if they open their markets, French industry will, would be swamped. And I think that's probably quite a realistic proposition. But of course, that means that there's a very strong industrial lobby group in France, which would prevent any government from realistically embracing free trade. The problem in 1859 is, um, that relations between Britain and France have got so bad during this hysteria around this, um, you know, this fear over invasion, that both sides actually, I mean, Palmerston and Napoleon, they're both trying to de-escalate things. Um, Napoleon is not really interested in invading Britain. He wants Britain quiet on the sidelines as an ally um, because Napoleon in 1859 is more interested in promoting Italian unification. And he goes to war with Austria over the question. And he is a great promoter of Italian um, sort of freedom from Austria. Um, so he's determined to make, you know, sort of quiet Britain up a bit. Palmerston wants some kind of resolution to the, the escalation intentions. And the solution, as I say, is free trade. There's a, a radical um, free pro, very, free, um, very pro free trade uh, MP in Parliament, um, Richard Cobden. And he's in communication with the lead 
promoter of free trade in France, uh, Michel Chevalier. During 1859, they correspond and they say, well, you know, actually, we should have free trade. This would de-escalate things. And it's because it's a matter of Victorian, in Britain, Victorian faith, that any country that's committed to free trade is not interested in invading you. There's this kind of belief that if you're free trading with someone, you won't invade them because your economies will become so interconnected. If you have unification of the economy, eventually you'll have some sort of political interest, some shared social integration. Um, so free trade is, is this principle on which the future of international affairs can theoretically be arranged. So Cobden goes to Palmerston and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Gladstone, and proposes that he goes to Paris, he meets Napoleon, and he negotiate a free trade treaty. Um, Gladstone doesn't want free trade with France. Actually, Cobden doesn't want free trade. It's really, it's bizarre in, in 2022 to be saying this, but Cobden worries that Britain has too much trade, that Britain is being too productive. And he's worried that free trade would cause such a massive increased demand for labor from the British worker that it would put, even though he's radical and supposed to be a great reformer, he's worried that British workers will actually have too much power over the economy because their, their labor will be in such demand. And he, you know, he writes, we just don't want any more trade. We've just got so much. We, what would we do with all that extra profit? Um, so he doesn't That's really want the free trade. This, you <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he's, he's really, he doesn't really want the free trade, but he recognizes that it's, it would be the way of ensuring, it, it would be the way of selling to the British public the idea that Napoleon's France is a peaceful France. So he negotiates this, but he meets Napoleon. Napoleon doesn't want free trade because he knows that it will ruin France's iron industry. Um, and basically, they do sign a treaty in January 1860, and both sides agree to remove the tariffs. And it's celebrated. It's really a diplomatic political coup. And it, it does defuse international tensions between two countries. Um, is it that effective? Is it really free trade? Well, not really. Britain does remove an awful lot of tariffs on French imports, um, but France doesn't. France, I mean, there are some imports from Britain that were prohibited. The, um, this bar on certain British products is replaced with, you know, sort of like 40% tariffs. So it's still pretty, um, it's not free trade at all. And other, other, uh, other imports that were, um, were taxed before, the tariffs are lowered slightly over the next 10 years, but it's very gradual. And um, I think overall, there's a, a very complicated economic analysis of this, which is far, far beyond my understanding. But I think that it basically came to a conclusion that countries that were affected by this free trade treaty um, saw overall tariffs reduced by about 48%, which is significant, but it's certainly not free trade. It's not. And then we get to the later part of the 19th century. We're now moving towards a point where cooperation is starting to founder, isn't it? And what are the reasons for that? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this free trade treaty coincides with um, this moment where Britain and France both invade China and take, uh, take Beijing. So there's also a military context. The free trade treaty also ushers in a decade of discussions over Britain and France adopting the same measurement standards, both going on the metric system, which is pretty controversial at the time. But throughout the 1860s, the countries do drift apart. All these grand visions, they kind of, they do, they do collapse. And I suppose the reason for this is partly down to Napoleon. Napoleon, up until about 1860, 1861, is an incredibly dominating international figure. Um, but he, he really loses the plot. He kind of, he loses any sort of sense of coherent international direction. Like he doesn't really know what he wants anymore. Um, he becomes quite lethargic. Um, I mean, actually, if you look at pictures of him, I think his health deteriorates quite seriously. In terms of domestic politics, he, he was so flexible and shrewd during the 1850s. Um, by the 1860s, he's really lost that. On the British is side, Mac, is this tying in with? Is he not also dealing with all that mayhem in Mexico as well? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll let Edward comment on that. But yes, there is that. But that's that's Mad. a bed of his own making. Yeah. Um, so he can lie on it, lie on it, as far as I'm concerned. But that's just me and anybody with the name Napoleon. 
But I mean, he's just cooking up stuff, you know, it's, it's just like basically any international scheme or something, you know, I mean, at one point he's trying to buy Luxembourg just to make it look like France is expanding. He puts in an offer, you know, it's not a house, but he just loses so much direction during the 1860s. There's a joke to be had about the Germans turning up in August 1914 and their army of 600 going, OK, you can have it. So <laughs> we're trying to pay for it. My God, he, yeah, he certainly put in a, a too high a bid. But um, I, I suppose the thing is that um, on the British side, you've also got a lack of direction because Palmerston is well past his prime. You know, he's just pretty old, really. Um, and obviously dies in the mid 60s. So Palmerston, these two dominant figures of international politics, are, you know, their stars are on the wane. And really 1860 confirms this um, with the, uh, the, the German, the Austrian German invasion of Denmark. Um, so uh, Germany invade, well, Prussia, I suppose at the time, but you know, as part of the unification of Germany um, invades Denmark, there's a territorial disagreement over, is it the duchies of, is it, Schleswig, Schleswig and Holstein. I never know whether I'm pronouncing it right. Roughly um, how Bly says it when he's complaining, but yeah. <laughs> but um, but basically, Britain and France do nothing. Uh, they can't really do anything. I mean, um, it's a land war, so were there to be any military intervention, the French would have to do the majority of the fighting and also take most of the risk. Um, so Napoleon's not that keen to get involved. Um, Palmerston does prepare. If I think he basically says, well. If the Germans threaten Copenhagen, we'll send the navy, but obviously that's not much good for inland duchies. Um, Napoleon eventually proposes that Britain and France orchestrate a sort of international conference to de-escalate things, but by then the Germans have sort of already invaded and won the war and taken all the territory that they want. So Britain and France are just made to look completely ridiculous. Um, and when they do, this is the moment, this is probably the first moment in international affairs during the 1850s and 1860s, where they don't unite. You know, they unite in 1854 against the threat of Russia. They go into Russia. OK, the Crimea is a disaster, but they do win the Crimean War. Um, you know, there's the threat of, what threat really, but there's a question over Chinese trade and there's hostilities with China. Britain and France come together and they go into China. They launch an offensive into China and they take Beijing. So in the space of four or five years, Britain and France go to war in and win against both China and Russia. In 1864, they don't unite over a rising Germany. And the result is that neither, neither power really has much influence in European affairs. And then by 1870, with the Franco-Prussian War, obviously the downfall of Napoleon, Britain doesn't do anything to help France there either. And that leads to the fall of France and Britain's left quite isolated in Europe because they didn't cooperate. I think Kitchener ends up nearly causing a diplomatic incident by going up in that French balloon, doesn't he? Uh, I think he's like 20 at the time, but yeah, he, uh, he's there observing and working for a field ambulance with a friend and living in utter squalor. He nearly dies, the conditions are so bad. Uh, but someone asks him if he wants a ride in a French military balloon and because he's a serving British officer. <laughs> That's why they give him a campaign medal in 1913 because by then, obviously, we've got the Entente Cordiale, which we will talk about. But what sort of a, an impact does the drifting apart have on both countries before we get to that? Well, um, I mean, I would say it's probably far more, um, I think the effect is very great on both countries, but it's probably felt more and acknowledged more in France. I think if, if you look at a map of the world in 1860, and then you look at a map of the world in 1900, you would think that Britain and France's empires had just expanded hugely. But actually, you know, both countries are internationally, they're behind the level of dominance that they had in 1860 by 1900. There are more global rivals. And France in particular is, is far more shaky. You know, France is far more concerned about its border with Germany at the end of the century. I think that the drifting apart of the two nations, well, I mean, obviously, as I've said, um, it results in, you know, the collapse of, of Napoleon's, of the, of the Napoleonic empire um, in 1870, siege of Paris in 1871. France has no allies in, in Europe. Um, and the Germans are able to, you know, march into Paris, take it over and, and turn the Prussian king into a German emperor in Versailles Palace. Um, and 
you know, it sort of ushers in, you know, like it's over a decade of sort of Bismarck in power throughout the continent, which Britain is really quite isolated from. Um, Britain, I think during the second half of the 19th century, maybe some people disagree, but I think Britain in Europe loses a lot of influence. Um, it does increase its influence beyond Europe. France too becomes more influential outside of Europe. I mean, France builds up another empire. It obviously lost most of its empire in the 18th and early 19th century wars with Britain. During the late 19th century, Brit um, France takes you know, Indochina, it will be Vietnam, it gets Madagascar, it expands into Africa. Um, and it becomes a sort of colonial power again that it wasn't really it, by the mid 19th century. It was so very what important. What I'm saying really is the drifting apart is a mitigating factor in the outbreak of the First World War, then, because if it doesn't happen, then maybe Germany doesn't surge ahead like she does and make every and make the French panic. Um, and then because Germany ends up being like the fastest growing nation there is, um, and France craps itself, which is part of a contrib uh, contributing factor to the First World War. And Britain has no stake in this because she has no relationship with France. So that's kind of what you're saying. I, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't make such a bold claim. Historian now crapping himself that I'm going to attribute this theory to. <laughs> he doesn't really understand. <laughs> I, um, no, I, I think that that's probably. I mean, I think the drifting apart probably. Oh God, I don't want to sound. You know, I don't want to become. I don't want to sound all deterministic and, and sort of like taking a long view and hindsight and all that sort of stuff. But it, it is very tempting to see it that way, isn't it? Yeah. I think really. I mean, you know, from eighteen seventy one, Germany. It, 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 there's a there's a change before the eight, before eighteen seventy. France is a great rival on the continent. After eighteen seventy, it's unquestionably Germany. Well, Germany um, unifies then. So Germany's not Germany until then. That's well, that's true. I suppose it's gradually uh, unifying by plucking bits of Austria and Denmark and then uniting all the German states. Um, yeah, so under pressure, I suppose, really. Um, Zach, save him. Save him with another question. <laughs> Shall we move it on to the Entente Cordiale? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we move on to the, the Entente Cordiale? <laughs> I mean, is this, is this an inevitability? um i'm i'm also I, I, you know solidarity with you i'm not a first world war historian so i would also be scared by alex sort of turning around and going no it's so not I'm, like, I'm not challenging i'm not like i don't <laughs> i'm saying that i agree i'm saying that it's a good point i'm saying that it is actually a way of framing it that kind of says well yeah actually um, if we weren't scrabbling about where we were looking for allies and France wasn't so hung up on her defeat in 1870, uh, then maybe World War One doesn't happen. So, yeah, it's, it's a good point. No, I think, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think Britain perhaps could have stepped in in 1870 to mediate or perhaps, you know, calm things down. It, the fact that the Germans were able to walk into Paris and the fact that they were able to, um, I mean, God, the siege of Paris is such an embarrassing... There's a story, I hate to get all anecdotal, but there's a story where Britain felt so guilty, or apparently people in London felt so guilty about leaving the French to the mercies of the Germans, um, that they had a whip round and sort of sent food over to France. And they were, they didn't send any soldiers or any military aid, but we sent lots of food to Paris because obviously they were eating all their zoo animals. So, you know, they were evidently hungry. But then um, in fairness though, Napoleon kind of called Prussia's bluff and got punched in the face. Yeah. I think he probably punched himself in the face um but like yeah definitely I mean that but then it was Bismarck who cunningly lured him in you know sort of set up the yeah. trap and you know I, it is unfortunate for Napoleon this is Napoleon the third obviously it, it is unfortunate for Napoleon that he gets into a pissing contest with yeah. the greatest brain in Europe at the time isn't it yeah and he's really quite past it as well there's have you seen that there's a tragic picture um after Sedan where there's, uh, there's this picture of Bismarck and, um, and Napoleon III after he's been captured. I mean, captured in a battle as an, you know, loss of almost total destruction of his army. And he's just sitting there. He's no longer an emperor. He's just sitting there next to Bismarck. And it's just like this old sort of worn out emperor, ex-emperor. And as you say, the big brain of Europe. It's, it's, it's such a powerful picture. 
Although, in fairness to France, they kind of, if you go to the Alsace Museum in Strasbourg, there's a squished William the First head, which kind of gets their own back, that they knock off a statue uh, afterwards, after World War I, and drag through the streets, and it's all squished. It's like a statue head, but it's all mashed where they dragged it through the streets as if to go, ha ha, we won in the end. They, they did get a bit obsessed with that. They did get, I, I think, you know, 1870, 71, it's very hard to overemphasize how hung up, as you say, the, the French get over that. And maybe, maybe actually that's the answer to the question of is the Entente Cordiale inevitable? Um, perhaps it is inevitable because of the French obsession with uh, the potential of Germany to invade again. I mean, France completely reorientates its culture after 1871. Um, it, interestingly, speaking for on behalf of historians, France develops a whole new school of historical thought, a whole new generation of historians and changes the curriculum of its schools. And it's all a history of France, of France being this great enlightener as this great sort of bastion of civilization and progress and Germany being basically barbaric. So for sort of 40 years between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War, every generation of school children is just indoctrinated with this idea of like there sort of being this, this great continual progress in France from from monarchy to Republican government and sort of terror to Napoleon one and then the third and eventually to Republic again. Um, so, you know, France is constantly concerned with, um, with, the, with the problem of Germany. And I mean, I think that this fear of Germany, there's, so in 18, 1898, the great, so you've got these worsening relations between Britain and France throughout the 19th century, which is mostly over Egypt. France has the canal, but then Britain goes in and seizes the canal and seizes Egypt in 1882. Um, and France is, France is really angry about this. And Britain promises that it will withdraw, but it doesn't withdraw. It stays in Egypt, well, <laughs> tries to stay there until the 50s. Um, so the French see the British, this Egypt question as, as a huge headache, um, and they never get over it for like 20 odd years. Then in 1898, the French are trying, so the, the two great visions for African empire is the British empire, which would run from, uh, from north to south, from Egypt to Cape Town, Cairo to Cape Town, the railway. France has a vision for an east to west empire from Somalia across to, um, I suppose it's it holding in West Africa. And in 1898, it launches an expedition, um, which gets as far as Fushida, Fushida? Fushida. Fushida. Um, small outpost on the, on the Nile uh, in this uh, very far south in the Sudan. But it's the same year that the British have launched an invasion of the Sudan under Kitchener again. Um, and he's, you know, wiped out the, you know, the Sudanese forces at Umdamum and he arrives with this army at Fashoda. And uh, if I said it wrong again. <laughs> no, this is brilliant. You know, it doesn't matter if you say it wrong because it's no longer on the map because we had to take it off the map because it hurt the French's feelings because basically Kitchener rocks up. Now let's get really anecdotal. He rocks up with like a whole over the top military force. And there's these like, what, 30 odd bedraggled Frenchmen that have already walked yeah. halfway across Africa. And they're like, well, we're not backing down. We planted a flag. And he's like, well, you can plant your flag and you can stay here or I can go and get all of those guys behind me and we can whoop your ass. And the French go, okay. Uh, but yeah, it's taken off the map so that it doesn't remind the French of their climb down. So it, don't go looking for it on a map, anybody, because it's not there. I think for about 20 years afterwards, maybe even longer, I, I'm sure I heard a story that it was some, sometime in the 50s, there were administrators working in the French Foreign Office that were still referring to Fashida. Um, right. That it, place that doesn't exist. Anymore. That place that doesn't exist. I was being a definition for... French diplomatic fear of Britain. So it's, it's kind of like this, you know, like how in the British Foreign Office during the 20th century, no one ever mentioned Suez after 56. And like, you only had to say the word Suez and you'd have civil servants, you know, sort of offering their resignation. I think this is what it was for the French. It's like the military version is the Italian still crying at the word of Caporetto, isn't it? I, they do. I, Apparently, that's a, in Italian. You say, oh, it's all gone caporetto when something goes really, really wrong. Really? Yeah. Every country has a has a has a nightmare, has a ghost yeah. in the closet. But but basically, I think the reason the French back down is because they just can't afford. I mean, OK, they would have lost the fight 
in the Sudan, but they don't want to go to war with Britain because they're quite frightened about the Germans. So yeah. the Entente, it's certainly not inevitable. Nothing's inevitable. But it, I think by 1900, the early 1900s, both Britain and France realised that Germany is the big threat. And if they don't ally, there is the potential for war. Um, and of course, there is also the personal element as well. King Edward VII um, isn't particularly friendly towards the Germans. And I think it's very hard to overplay. It's because the... he can't stand Willy, but yeah, <laughs> he hates <laughs> the Kaiser. They hate each other. Um, they go. Yeah, it's very well, Danish wife. Danish. You sorry, know, this is it. like this is my like royal stuff coming in now. But they just do this ridiculous pantomime of hating each other's guts, but pretending to like each other at functions sometimes when they're not just ripping sheets off of each other. But yeah, that it the personal does come into it. But more than anything, he loved France, didn't he? Uh, and the women. Um, and French women. Don't even get me started on Edward the Seventh and women. I was talking about smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> well, it was it was very friends. handy dipl diplomatically, wasn't it? I mean, if he'd been prudish, I, I, I'm not sure the Parisians would. I mean, if you've seen his Parisian sex chair, he definitely wasn't prudish. No, I I, I don't think so. I, I I don't I don't know about that. I, I I've never gone in for that sort like, of. This thing. is I why mean, like, 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 in historical research. Diplomatic history is not torturing me. Google it. It's a lot. <laughs> It's come up on History Act before. There's diagrams online of how we might have used it because it's quite confusing. I think I'll Google that on my brother's computer. I don't want that in my search history. <laughs> um, but um, no, I think it, I think is uh, when when the Germans invaded Denmark in 1864, he was supposed to have said, "Wait till I'm king" or something like that. So. I think I don't know, but I do know that Queen Alexandra never ever ever got over that ever. She, I mean, it's the reason why. Uh, they spend all the time in the world with the Russian royals when George V is little and he's friends with Nikki and Willie's not around one because there's a bit of an age disparity but also as well because she like she used to flip her lid if she saw him wearing a, an honorary German uniform I think there's a quote about her little Georgie in a filthy pickle halber or something because he's wearing a lot of an honorary German uniform but she, yeah she hated the Germans so it's gonna but color to be fair, Willie, I mean, he wouldn't have been able to have joined in um, with with all the with all the sports that uh, that George and Nicholas would have been playing. Right. With. So there is that brilliant anecdote. One more anecdote, and then we'll we'll let you round off. But yeah, uh, that Willie did the uh, honorary trip to Eton College just up the road from Windsor Castle. And I think this is just after the Boa War and he's reviewing the OTC and, oh God love him, someone fired their rifle by accident and his horse bolted. And obviously he's only got one good arm and he was only supposed to sit on the horse. Um, and then it dragged him all over the playing field to Eton, basically. Uh, there's a brilliant quote by one who says, the only two things that I ever have uh, my generation of Etonians ever had to thank that man for after World War One was the extra day off we got when he came to visit from lessons uh, and the sight of him being dragged all over the plane. Oh my god, I, I kind of feel a bit sorry for him, really. I mean, he, uh, yeah. I mean, he is an absolute loon, but I doubt anyone childhood issues definitely come into play there that weren't his fault. Mm, yes, no. This has been really interesting, but I'm just going to ask one question to, to finish it off. Um, this perspective, it's new. Uh, I didn't make any secrets at the start that I, it took a bit of getting my head around. I think you've done a really great job of convincing us. But why do you think it's been ignored up until now? Um, well, I think it's probably... I think a lot of it has, uh, there's probably several reasons. I mean, the first is uh, the idea of Britain and France being rivals rather than allies is inherently funny. Um, I mean, there was that book published a few years ago, I think it's called A Thousand Years of Annoying the French. And I think, yeah, that, I think that that's sold it. quite well. Um, and, you know, there are, the British and French people, I think, are, are fundamentally, there, there is a difference. Um, and I think there's a lot of envy between them, I think, in some respects. So, I mean, I don't know. If ever you go out for a meal with someone from Paris or someone, you know, some French. Actually, this is what got me onto this project in the first place, was going out for a meal with someone from France. And you go out and they're very stylish. They have incredible taste. They, in food, in, in clothes, they're very elaborate. And there's, you know, as an English person, you look at that and you think, wow, that's really impressive. 
And, but then at the same time, they look at an English person and English people are quite self-deprecating, quite humorous, easygoing. And I think there's a sort of weird kind of envy that way as well, because the French are very serious and very self-critical. And so there's kind of like this slight confusion from either side. I think the French can't understand how we're so untidy, but how we're so easygoing. And we can't understand how they're so sophisticated, but also so uptight. Um, you know what's ironic, though, whenever you go anywhere else in the world and the Brits meet up with the French, like say I'm like we've done like I was on a, a thing in Egypt and you gravitate towards each other because you're really not that different. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is the thing when neighbours, you know, differences, small differences between people are usually hyped up more than big differences, aren't they? I think, you know, that's why really, is there much difference between, oh God, I hope this isn't going to get me in trouble, but is there that much difference between, you know, sort of like English and Welsh and Scots people really when it comes down to it? I mean, I don't know. I have to say that, you know, I think people in Cornwall are absolutely no different to people in Wales. Um, I just said I've been stuck on a cruise boat on the middle of the Nile and the French and the British sat together laughing at the utter bizarreness of some of the other nationalities on that boat. <laughs> I, I found myself once in the middle of um, in the middle of China and uh, I bumped into a group of people from Flanders. And um, yeah, I think the Flemish are very, very peculiar in some ways. Um, but, you know, it was just so glad to see them, just just to meet up with some people and just be able to review what, you know, what China, you know, what was going on in China. It was it was really nice. Better the but, devil um, you know. Sorry? Better the devil you know. Yeah. But I mean, I suppose the reason that this perspective has been ignored is that it's I mean, the overwhelming reason really is it, it's political, isn't it? It, it, it's not got anything to do with hi historical fact or, you know, sort of like the reality of, of relations. It's, it's, it's really, it's very good for politicians to be able to stoke up, you know, antagonism between Britain and France. And then, of course, that fits into this history of Waterloo and Trafalgar and all the past. You know, you, you get arguments over, you know, fishing licences. I mean, what a small part of the economy are fishing licences for Britain. There's a wonderful meme going round, which is a picture from 200 years ago of two generals going, this was, was England versus France. I will fight you for the world's biggest empire. And then below it says, and this is now, and it's two fish. This is mine. No, it's mine. This is my territory. <laughs> I was at a, I was at a, a Frexit rally. I, I wasn't actually participating in the rally. It was an accident. There's I, a hell of a lot of that all over France. There's Frexit graffiti everywhere. It's completely bizarre. I just, I mean, it's, don't they think about their agricultural subs? Anyway, no, no, but um, there was, I, I went to Bourges for, for, for the cathedral, the architecture, not for the politics. I found myself in the middle of this Frexit rally and they were all Frexiteers and they were all unvaccinated and they were all anti-mask. Um, so like all of these kind of like popular things have all come together and I think that for someone like Macron you know he sort of he has to you know he has to be I think just focusing attention on what's happened to Britain now that it's left the EU and saying look if you go on your own you're going to get isolated and you're not even going to be able to fish your own waters is a very effective way of him trying to calm sort of popular protest in, in France and say actually we're not leaving the EU so I think the reason that you know, perhaps the more positive side of the Anglo-French relationship over the last 200 years. The reason that it's buried is because it serves modern politics um, and it's not entertaining, I think. Edward, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about um, essentially how Britain has been trying to love the French and vice versa <laughs> by everybody uh, trying to not let it happen because uh, we're all our own worst enemies. Uh, it's been really interesting. Zach, have you been convinced? Are you convinced that there was some some liking going on between the two sides? Yeah, I've got to say it's it's a uh, it's when you dig into it, it's a much more convincing argument than just sort of turning around to somebody and going, "Yeah, the French actually we love them." And like you say, it's it's that thing of there's the temptation isn't there and it was funny that you you talked about that book you know a thousand years of annoying the french because that was exactly the first thing that kind of came up in my mind when i was sort of starting to flick through this book to prep for it that it's you've got this kind of popular thing of french bashing inverted commas and then actually when you start to dig into it and you put together a really articulate and convincing argument here you know there's there's far more to it and it's far more subtle than people have given it credit for which really is just that's history right it's more subtle than the caricature of course yeah there have been hostilities i i know i mean even 
um, the, the publishers that I'm with, you know, they've been absolutely fantastic, lovely. They've you know produced a really lovely book. And I'm very, very pleased. But I did think it was funny that even my own publishers have tried to sabotage my own argument on the back of the book. They picked the one quote from the book that wasn't about Anglo-French corporation. It was um, Harold Macmillan. Uh, in the 1960s when he went over and tried to negotiate Britain's entry into the EU and all the EU nations said yeah sure Britain can join that's fine especially the Germans they were well up for it um and de Gaulle you know famously said no and refused vetoed Britain's entry Macmillan went back and sadly wrote in his diary you know what's it there are many uncertainties but in the end one thing is certain the French always betray you and they took that quote and put that on the back of the book. And it's, I have to say, this is it though, you can't say France without wanting to trash them and they can't do it. They can't not trash us. Like you can't even say to them about like, oh, I'm getting the channel, I'm getting the Euro tunnel, I'm getting the channel tunnel over. It's not, it's not the channel, it's not the English channel. What? They can't, no, we can't let it go and neither can they. Exactly. But I think, I think behind, but it's humorous, I think mostly, isn't it? Mostly it's humorous. And then once you kind of get beyond the absurdity, I mean, I have to say, you know, like th there was a lot of, I, I think whenever I've been to France, I think, you know, when you meet just ordinary people on the streets and, and chat with them, they're just lovely, they're really, really friendly. And they seem to really like the English. Interestingly, I should really stop. I know we've already wrapped up. Wherever I went, everyone I met who was French told me how much they liked the French, uh, they liked the English, but they all told me how much they disliked the French. Yeah. Which was completely <laughs> mystifying. I'm not exaggerating. Everyone said, oh, you know, there's Anglais, oh, you know, they're lovely, they're funny, very nice, très drôle. And, and then it was like, <laughs> and there was one woman who, you know, said that she hated the French because they were very arrogant. She didn't speak any English. She told me that she hated the French because they were arrogant. She disliked the Americans because um, they all walk around. I couldn't really translate it properly, but apparently with um, ice creams on their head, um and she oh she, maybe that was a french way of cussing a top knot in which case i'm all for that argument and no it was a glass uh, like a, an, an ice she said um like when it was when it was very hot i i worked out that she said when it's very very hot the americans put ice creams um on their head and she said i don't like the americans but the english they're lovely really nice and I was like, oh, she's oh, taking oh. cultural references from like family guy or something and she's got a bit baffled <laughs> 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 thank you so much this has been brilliant uh i've gone forever uh we will put your book on the um history hack bookstore buy it from there because zach what's your line don't give your money to jeff bezos to spend on rocket fuel uh if you buy it on bookshop.org we get a cut the author gets a cut and independent bookstores get a cut and you don't make zach angry because you don't want to see zach angry um it's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's been it's been lovely. I'm really, really very flattered to be invited. <laughs> I did find it quite funny that you went from being utterly terrified in the beginning. Did you notice that to subtly dragging us back onto the point of the conversation when we started waffling? Uh, so yeah, so he got over the fear pretty quickly. Oh, Zach, do you want to uh, quickly round us off? I know we've taken you out of your happy comfort zone at the moment. Say something mean about a Napoleon. Um, I mean, I could make my characteristic comment about Tottenham in relation to Napoleon, but that, that would be unprofessional of me. Uh, no. There's an in-joke that I'll explain to Ed at the end of that. But no, this was great, Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.